So welcome to How to Position Your Startup for Venture Capital Financing. My name is Ali Edbeck Ely. I'm an attorney with Foley and Lardner. I'll give a little bit of background about myself, about the firm, and then we'll dive right into the topic of how to get your company ready to do some VC financing. Next slide, please. So a couple of quick housekeeping issues to take care of. This is an educational program. I'm going to be talking about legal concepts sort of at a high level, not intending for this to be considered legal advice, uh, not intending for this to apply to your specific set of facts. You may have a particular scenario and want some information. I encourage you to reach out to me separately and I'd be happy to chat with you, but uh, don't want you to take what I'm providing today and apply it to your particular circumstances. This is really educational. As you know, uh, facts and circumstances dictate a lot of issues that come into the um, uh, startup space and on how to approach things, how to handle things, how to set things up. And so whatever I'm providing today may or may not be applicable to your particular circumstance. Next slide, please. So here's the agenda really quickly. We'll talk about a little bit of background overview of what we're going to be covering. We'll talk about some general structural considerations. <clears throat> what's important early on in the startup uh, phase when we have founders that are just getting going with the company and very early personnel. What are some of the different financing options that you should be considering or thinking about? We'll talk, talk a little bit about what those are, convertible securities. We'll talk about um, valuation and dilution an overview of what a venture capital financing looks like, and then how to get you ready, in, as I call it, investment ready. So how to get yourself ready to then do a VC financing, how to prepare for closing, and then we'll talk a little bit about some of the common pitfalls I've seen over the years, and then we'll open it up for Q&A. So I'll, I do this, um, I've been doing this presentation now for a while, and so I, I'll try to take some questions as I'm talking, if, it, if it's relevant to the topic at hand, I may save some for the end, but, but please do send in questions or comments. I, I welcome participation. I want to make this as useful as possible for all of you that are attending. So if you have a particular question or if you have a particular comment, please feel free to put it in the chat. I'll either get to it during the conversation we're having or potentially um, as we get to the end and reserve some time for a QA. day. So let's uh, go to the next slide, please. So a little bit about my background. I'm a corporate attorney. I focus a lot on emerging growth and venture capital, work with startups and investors. So I see both sides of, of the equation. Uh, I've been practicing about 25 years, work out of uh, Foley's San Francisco office. I work with companies that are local to the Bay Area, that are in California, other parts of the states, as well as um, internationally. I've done a lot of cross-border work representing companies that are looking to set up uh, a presence in the U.S helping them understand and navigate some of the challenges of, of establishing a business in the U.S. And it's everything from, as we say, garage to global. So helping you set up your company, helping you raise financing agreements, position yourself all the way through to an exit, um, whether that's an M&A type transaction or what have you, and everything in between. <clears throat> love working with entrepreneurs, love the passion, the innovation, the energy, it's just great being a, a part of that and helping a lot of the founders and entrepreneurs and companies that are going through this adventure, as well as the investors that are investing in, in these companies. So it's it's really something I, I enjoy and um, love working in this space. Next slide, please. I'm going to skip over that. Preparation, I'll, there'll be a recurring theme you'll hear me talk about over and over again. It's it's really critical as, as we go through the topic. I'll, I'll show you where that's going to be key. Next slide, please. So a little bit about Foley and Lardner. Um, we are a 180 year old firm, been around for a long time. We are an international law firm with offices in the US. We have some offices outside the US as well. And it's a full service um, law firm that provides legal services in a very wide range of areas. You know, certainly in the corporate area that I'm in, we also handle intellectual property. We handle tax. Uh, litigation, we handle compliance and regulatory issues. Um, there probably isn't an area that you could think of that we don't handle. Uh, we do immigration work as well, which ties in nicely with a lot of the startups. If we've got uh, companies overseas that are coming to set up in the U.S., we also can handle the immigration issues that come up as a result of that. Labor and employment, commercial agreements, and then everything in between. So 
Um, it's great to have a platform that can allow me to offer these types of services to my clients where they might call me with a number of different issues uh, on a daily basis, and I can pull in the right uh, colleagues to help. Next slide, please. We cover you know, all the different industries. We have a focus of the four sort of main industries, health and sciences, energy, innovative technology, and manufacturing. But within there, we've done and worked with companies in all sorts of different businesses. Next slide, please. Okay, so that was a little bit about me, a little bit about the firm. Let's start off with structural considerations, which is sort of one of the initial topics that you should be thinking about. If you've already set up your company, if you've set it up as a Delaware C Corporation, great. If you haven't, you know, you should be thinking about, do you need to change it to be a Delaware C Corporation? And the reason why, there's a lot of reasons, but the primary reason is investors like Delaware and they like C Corporations. And in some cases, many cases, investors are going to insist that when they invest in a company, that it be a Delaware C Corporation. So very quickly, Delaware being the preeminent state, it, most of the publicly traded companies in the U.S. are Delaware corporations. Delaware has a very um, good statute for corporations. It's reviewed regularly. It's updated regularly. It's well written. It's pretty well balanced. The the courts that you would go to if you have a dispute in Delaware, the Chancery Court, are all. Um, decided by judges that have a lot of experience in business law. They typically are business lawyers before they get on the bench. So their entire career has been steeped in business law. Very different than some of the other states where you might have judges that had a criminal law background or a family law background, don't understand business at the, at the, the, into the, in the depth that a uh, judge sitting in the Chancery Court in Delaware might. So you typically have a, a much better bench that's listening to the cases as they go through obviously better chances for a better result if they understand the details at a, at a very sort of micro level. So that's one that's one of among a number of reasons. Easy to work with the Delaware, Delaware Secretary of State. They're usually pretty quick on turnaround time and filings and things like that. And then the entity type is, is because investors don't want to invest in a partnership. They don't want to invest typically in an LLC. Uh, they don't want pass through treatment. So if you know a little bit about the different entities, there are entities that are passed through, meaning the the income coming into the entity is not taxed at the entity level, it's passed through to the owners. So that's typically your partnership, LLCs also. Or you have your C corporation, which the tax coming in, you know, the, the taxable revenue coming into the corporation is taxed at the corporate rate. And then whatever distributions are made to the shareholders are taxed again. So there's a double, double layer of taxation. However, for VC investors, they don't want the pass through and they're looking primarily at the C corporation. So they don't want to have the pass through go down into their funds. It creates all sorts of issues for them. So they typically will insist upon a C corporation. Um, next slide, please. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about documentation for early founders and early personnel. This is an area that I emphasize a lot. It's an area that I think oftentimes founders will skip over or maybe not pay enough attention to. It's something that investors will look at very carefully. And, and there's a number of reasons why. One of them being, as the company is being set up, and now you've got founders, some of the founders may be the technical folks that are building the technology, creating the technology or creating other aspects that are going to be super valuable. Investors are going to want to make sure that whatever is being created, intellectual property, technology, trade secrets, whatever it is, that it belongs to the company, right? Because they're investing in the company and they want to make sure that whatever they're investing in, it is where the assets are that have value. So the worst thing that can happen is founders set, a couple founders get together. They One of the founders is the tech being some new software platform. It's awesome. It solves a great uh, problem in the market. It's going to be a, a, you know, a huge company. The problem is they never get the right documentation in place. That founder ends up leaving after a few months after she developed the core technology and the company never got an assignment of rights to that technology. So the founder, founders walk away at owning the work she created. She doesn't have any owner. But now that's the core technology they need to build their business. They have to that founder and be part of 
and get in the center by talking to the sign all over the half number of times. But that's one reason why it's really critical to get good documentation and properly. I certainly recommend you have a lawyer do it that is a space that understands the issues. And especially I'm mean, investors are going to be looking at some documentation to make sure everything's buttoned up properly. So also confidentiality, making sure that people are getting access to the company's confidential information or private information have some sort of um, agreement in place that they can't just go out and use the information or disclose it. And one of the assignments I talked about, we, we use an acronym CII or PIIA, it's Confidential Information Invention Assignment Agreement or Proprietary. And that, um, you know it's novel to the agreements that you want people to sign so that whatever they're developing the company belongs to the company. Those, those couple of variable issues are we're not going to be on. Yeah, I think it's important, especially if people are going to have any sort of blue stake to make sure that there is proper resting so that if someone has in the company a founder with a teacher reach out to teach that app is going to be restricted essentially even at some point before the investing occurs the company can repurpose that stock essentially Ollie Dodd yes Hi, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. I think we're all experiencing some tech issues from your end. I just wanted to let you know. Uh, do you mind uh, turning off and getting back into the meeting? We're experiencing a major lag from your end. Okay, so I'm going to go back in. Okay, apologies, everyone. I'm going to close it out and I'll tell you. All right, well, apologies, everyone. <laughs> We sometimes do have some technical uh, issues, so appreciate your patience and us working through that. So I'm not sure where things got left when when my voice wasn't coming through. OK, I'll, I'll run through this again quickly. So going back to the issue of documentation for founders and early personnel, just quickly overview. Um, it's uh, really important to get good documentation in place, get a good lawyer that understands the space that works with startups to make sure you cover confidentiality issues. You've covered the assignment of any IP that's being developed that should be transferred or signed over to the company so the company owns it. And then I think I was talking lastly about vesting of securities. And, and the vesting concept is something you'll you'll see oftentimes, you know, you see it with founders, you see it with early employees, you see it with consultants. So anyone who's getting equity in the company, typically you're gonna want those shares or options to be vested, to, to vest over time, and for there to be restrictions so that. If anyone leaves or the relationship is terminated before the shares are fully vested, that the company has the right to repurchase those shares, usually at the same price that the person purchased for them, which in an early stage company that's being set up, it's usually very nominal purchase price. So it's very easy for the company to buy those shares back if we're talking about shares that have been issued. If you're talking about options, the best thing works a little bit differently. So if you give someone an option early on, that option will vest over time, typically four years with a one year cliff, which essentially means they have to put in four years of work. After the first year of, of work, they will vest in 25% of the option shares, which means after the, after the first year, they'll be able to exercise the option and purchase up to 25% of the shares that are covered by that option. And then thereafter, on a monthly basis, it'll vest in equal amounts until at the end of that four year period, they fully vested in all of the options. So they could then exercise and purchase all of the options that they were given. So that works a little differently than restricted stock. So if at some point in time, let's say within month four or five of having been given an option with that vesting that I just mentioned, the person leaves or they're, or they're terminated, then basically all of those options expire. They, they basically terminate. And so the person has left the company None of those options had vested, so they have no opportunity to exercise and purchase any shares. They walk away, they haven't put in their time, so they don't have the opportunity to purchase any of their of those options and walk away with equity. And the reason why you want to do that essentially is you don't want people to get involved with the company, get equity in the company, and then before they put in their time, they walk away or the relationship terminates, didn't work out, et cetera. 
and now they walk away with a piece of the company, they're not going to be participating in helping the company grow and be successful. So it's better for the company to have the right to get that back, those shares or those options back so that uh, you don't have someone that's on the cap table with equity in the company that's not participating and helping it grow and be successful. So that's on options. On the stock, it works a little bit differently. The stock that's issued, it's issued to the person on day one. It's restricted. So they get the shares on day one, but it's restricted in the sense that if they were to leave before that four-year period, typically, then the company can buy back those shares um, at the same price they purchased them. That repurchase right, as we call it, lapses over time. It lapses over that four-year period. So you know, it's the same four-year period, one-year cliff. So after the first year of employment or, or consulting with the company, what have you, they can then actually, they'll have the first 25% that's free and clear. The, the repurchase right over those 25% of the shares lapses. So if they were to leave after year one, they could walk away. The company could repurchase the other 75%, but they still have the repurchase right on. But as to the first 25%, the repurchase right is lapsed. It is no longer effective, so they can't purchase that 25%. So that's how it works with restricted stock versus options. It works a little differently, but essentially it's the same thing. The company can buy back that equity or, or the equity disappears if it's options, so you don't have someone walking away with shares in the company. So one question that said, um, most of the advice so far has been focused in the U.S. Is this a uh, focused talk? Well, yes, I, I'm talking about you know, how to prepare your company for VC financing in the US. You know, every jurisdiction is different. So, you know, if you are a company that's in the United Kingdom and you want to go get financing in the United Kingdom, you're under a totally separate set of laws. The investors approach things a little differently. If you're in Asia or, or some other parts of the world, it, it's going to be different. I will tell you, however, however, the basic concepts are very similar. So when I've done deals that's involved, you know, companies in the UK or Asia or other parts of the world where we've done diligence, we typically will make sure we've got local counsel if we don't have offices in that, in that jurisdiction, but we will work on looking at the laws in that jurisdiction. But a lot of these basic concepts that I'm covering today are applicable no matter where you are. So, for example, making sure that the company owns the IP is critical. No matter where you are in the world, that's going to be important because you want to make sure the company owns it. If you're an investor, you don't want to invest in a company that doesn't own the technology that you're relying on in making your investment. Um, so I think uh, essentially it, it, a lot of these concepts will be applicable uh, no matter where you are. Okay, so what what is the strike price for options? Are they priced at the post money valuation? So that's a great question. I'm not going to get too much into the details of, of option pricing, but essentially the strike price, it's also called the exercise price, that's the price that the person that has the option can exercise and purchase the option. So call it exercise price, call it strike price. There are a, a number in the U.S., there are a number of tax regulations that require that options being granted um, in the private company setting are granted at fair market value. So typically the companies, when you set up an equity incentive plan, you also, if you're going to start uh, granting options, you want to go out and make sure you get a fair market value uh, valuation for the stock so you know what the fair market value is, and then you want to make sure you're granting at the fair market value. That's that would be your exercise price or your strike price. And you go out and get a valuation because if the IRS ever comes in and challenges the value that you determine for your stock, you've got a third party independent valuation firm that's gone out and done evaluation and come up with a fair market value. And oftentimes that would be something you can use to challenge the IRS if they come knocking and question your evaluation. And they'll oftentimes accept that. Um, so it's important. It's an important piece, but I don't want to get too far segued into that. But it is it is important to make sure you've got good counsel that understands how the options work, the pricing, the tax issues, because that whole piece of it can be really important. If you don't do it properly, there can be all sorts of tax consequences um, for the company, also for the person that's receiving the option. And in some cases, those lie dormant if nobody's handling it properly until there's some sort of impending event like an exit. And I've seen that happen where company granted a bunch of options, they weren't priced properly, there were all sorts of issues with it. When the company came to the point where they had a sale, that's when the, the buyers during the diligence phase uncovered these various option pricing issues, and it became a, a huge tax problem because if the company were to be sold, it typically 
people that have options would they exercise it and then they would sell their shares. That's how they make the proceeds. Um, they would get a piece of whatever their share value is at the exit. But because they weren't priced properly, there were tax consequences that came into place. So then they were going to be responsible for a whole bunch of taxes that they otherwise wouldn't have been responsible for had it been done properly. So it can create a lot of problems. And as the company grows, if it becomes really large and there's a huge value and then you sell for a large amount, then obviously that difference between what the price was that the option was given for, the exercise price, the strike price, and the actual value of the price, that can be a huge delta. And that's where there could be some tax consequences. So something to be thinking about. Um, RSUs are different than options. I'm not going to go too much into that. But um, yeah, there are there's restricted stock, there's RSUs, options, and then there's a number of other types of equity that can be given to early employees, consultants. Um, that's where you really need someone that's got a tax background. So I, I work closely with our tax group, our executive comp and, and tax benefit group to make sure that we appropriately address all those issues and create plans that are compliant with the tax regulations. Um, Question really quickly. So how does a person with uh, restricted stock or options protect themselves from working up to a day before the cliff and then being terminated, losing all of the compensation for their efforts to date? That is a great question. And I don't know that there is any easy answer. I think the easiest answer, maybe it's not an easy answer, but the realistic answer is you do a good job. You put in good effort. You make sure you're a valuable part of the company. Don't give the company your reason to terminate you. Most startups, if, if they're run properly with good leadership, and you're a good, valuable part of that company, there's no reason they're going to terminate you right before your options um, best because it doesn't really make sense, right? If you're contributing and helping to grow the company, why would they want to terminate you just to save on some amount of options they granted you? Typically for early employees and consultants, the company is not giving out a lot. It's not a large percentage of the company that is going to be given out. I mean, over time it becomes, that way, because you know, as you grow, you're going to give out more and more options. But initially, the amount that's given out is not a large amount. So even if you get one person that has a certain number of shares or a certain number of options, it's probably going to be fairly minimal. It's probably going to be a very low percentage on the cap table, and it wouldn't make sense for the company to terminate for that person just to save a fraction of a percent on you know ownership. It just would be very very unusual. Okay, so sorry, we got a little bit uh, sidetracked, but let's see if we can get back on track. The next topic in this area is transfer restrictions. So you wanna make sure you're looking at what sort of transfer restrictions should you have or, or, or you wanna have with regard to the share of the company. And you'll see those oftentimes in either shareholder agreements, which is really an agreement. It can be an agreement between the initial founders in some cases, in early stage companies, you might have a shareholder agreement that's with the original founders and maybe some of the early folks that got equity. Uh, there could be restrictions in the bylaws that, that give the company a, a, a right of first refusal. If somebody wants to sell their stock, they got to offer it to the company first. The company has the right to make an offer to see if they want to buy that <clears throat> before it can be sold to somebody else. Or there may be other restrictions about you got to get approval of the board, make sure you're complying with the securities regulations things of that nature. There could be uh, transfer restrictions in stock purchase agreements or, or some other agreements that the company signs with people that are getting equity. They could be side letters or things like that. You just want to be aware of all that because at some point in time, if people want to transfer shares, um, you need to know what those restrictions are. From a company standpoint, it makes sense to have some restrictions in place because you want to make sure you know who's on your cap table. So it becomes really important as you grow and if you're in a particular industry that's really competitive, the last thing you want is for one of your early investors who bought stock then later on to say, oh, yeah, I'm really not interested in this anymore. I'm going to transfer my stock. And oh, by the way, I'm transferring it to a company that's going to be one of your primary competitors. You know, typically companies don't want a competitor on their cap table. So if the company has restrictions in place, then they have the ability to stop that kind of a transfer. That could be detrimental because now you've got if it goes through and you've got now a competitor they will have access to some documents and information as a shareholder as an investor and that could be something you definitely don't want uh, to be um, happening okay uh comment about commenting on preferred versus common voting rights um 
That's a great, great topic. Um, I think we've got some time. I'll, I'll jump into that uh, really quickly. So when when you form a company, you typically form a company with common stock, which is your typical plain vanilla stock of the company. It's usually the stock that the founders get. It's usually the stock that early employees and consultants will get. It carries voting rights. Typically, it's it's one share, one vote, and that's pretty much about it. When you talk about preferred stock, that's the kind of stock that investors are interested in, and, and definitely your VC, more sophisticated investors are going to want preferred stock because it is preferred, and just by its name alone, that means it has some preferences, privileges, rights that are superior to the common stock. So typically, it's it's what the investors want because now they've got more rights, and the rights are all designed essentially to protect their investments. So they get certain rights to vote that the common shareholders may not have. They've got protective provisions so that if the company wants to do certain things, it has to go to the stockholder, the preferred stockholders, and get their consent. Um, they typically they'll typically be a liquidation preference, which means essentially if the company is sold or merges or has a liquidation event as it's defined in the charter and there are proceeds that come out of that but the proceeds are distributed according to a waterfall and the waterfall typically follows the priority of the shareholders so preferred stockholders would be given a liquidation preference first you know, before the common shareholders get anything and then after they've gotten what they're supposed to receive they'll the common stockholders will receive the remaining proceeds or in some cases the preferred stockholders will participate with the common and get distributed out whatever the remaining proceeds are that will go according to the ownership percentages of the common stockholders and the preferred stockholders. There's there's some other rights and preferences to dividends and other sort of things that are built into the charter for preferred stockholders that are things that the investors typically are looking for. I'm not going to go too much into that, but um, but that's the big distinction between the common stock and their preferred stock. And there can be many different types of uh, preferred stock. Typically, you, you, I'm sure you've heard of Series C or Series A, Series B, Series C, et cetera. They all have different preferences and have different rights than, than other uh, series of preferred stock. Okay, so thoughts on buy sell agreements for founders um, and therefore their estates and families. That, that's a really good point. It's something to be thinking about as a founder and maybe initially putting in place until you get to a point where you have a, a financing where you're selling preferred stock and we have a, a VC or a sophisticated investor coming to the picture. Because once you once you do a, a venture capital financing, there's going to be a whole suite of documents to come into play that'll have issues that deal with voting, issues that deal with transfer, um, issues that cover all sorts of rights, preferences, privileges for the stockholders. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so a lot of that stuff will be covered. But before that takes place, if you have multiple founders or you want to do some estate planning, then yes, definitely you can have what's referred to commonly either shareholders agreement, as I mentioned earlier, it can be called buy buy sell agreement. Essentially, it's agreement that governs the relationship between the founders vis-a-vis -vis the shares in the company. So it covers scenarios or contingencies that might come up. For example, what happens if you've got two founders, they each own 50%, and suddenly one of the founders passes away? or one of the founders gets sick and can't participate and make decisions for the company. If you're really 50-50, and let's say they also sit on the board, then you now have a potential stalemate or, or uh, the company is potentially paralyzed because you've got one 50% owner, one of the two directors that can't make decisions. They're in the hospital, they're you know disabled, whatever the case may be, or they passed away. And now how do you get votes done? How do you get decisions made? Because you've got 50% that can't vote. So there, there can be agreements put into place with the founders that, that provide for all of that, that provide if there's a disability, a death, uh, you know, whatever the case is, that this is what happens. The stock then can be voted by the, the existing founder or the ongoing founder. There might be opportunities or provisions that allow for one founder to buy the other founder out. All sorts of scenarios to cover those contingencies so that the company can continue to, to operate smoothly without any issues if someone something happens to to a founder let's say so that's kind of the concept of a buy sell agreement um, okay so we talked about transfer restrictions let's jump to the next slide please so financing options so here we get into different financing options and you know having worked with startups 
quite a long time, you know, everyone's always focused on when can I get some money? You know, who do I need to get money from? Who's going to write me a check? So the financing piece is oftentimes such a critical part of it. And, and obviously so, because most companies need capital to be able to develop, create technology, scale it, commercialize it, et cetera. You need to hire the right people to get the technology developed. Then you need to implement the, tech, the commercialization of the technology. You need to get it out there, you need sales. So the capital piece is absolutely critical. And so there are a number of different options early on to consider when you're looking to get capital for your company. If you're lucky enough, you've been around, you've got a couple of good exits, you've got capital to bootstrap and, and pay for stuff initially by yourself. I always think that's a good option it, only because that way you control everything. So if you're the founder and you've got the ability to bootstrap, I would I would say bootstrap as long as you can because the more you can bootstrap it and keep control and ownership of the company, the, the better it's gonna be because you can make all the decisions, you can decide the, the path of the company, where it's going, how it's going, um, and then defer the financing until the point where you really need to bring in additional or much larger financing because inevitably, as soon as you bring in financing as investors, you're gonna be giving up some piece of that pie some of the ownership and, and with it, some decision-making and some control and some economics. So early on then, you have a couple of options. There's convertible debt, there's convertible equity, and then you, there's your equity, which is if you were to you know, sell stock, preferred stock, as we were talking about, um, that's your sort of your priced equity round, as we call it, or your venture round. But before you get to that, easy ways, easier ways to raise money is to go out and, and get money by issuing a convertible note or by issuing a SAFE, which is you know, an acronym for a simple agreement for future equity. Those two types of instruments are typically relatively easy to put in place, less expensive on legal fees. And you, know, you can do that very quickly and get some early money in the door to continue to start scaling your company and growing. Next slide, please. Okay, so convertible securities, <clears throat> Essentially, it, it's a security that converts at some, you know, into some future security at a negotiated discount relating to some future qualified equity financing. I know it's kind of a mouthful, so let's kind of break that down a bit. So, and what I'm talking about here when I mean convertible securities, I'm really talking about convertible notes or, or the other option, which is the SAFE, which I maybe many of you have heard about with simple agreement for future equity. So they're they're convertible because you issue them on day one to an investor who's putting money in the company, it doesn't give them any shares at the day they invest. They get the right to get shares at a future point in time when the company then goes out and sells shares. And if it conducts what's what I refer to as a qualified equity financing, then at that point in time, their investment will convert into those shares that are being sold in that financing. So the pros are it avoids having to value the company. So when you when you issue a convertible note, you don't have to have a value for the company um, or a SIG. Easier to document, less expensive. The valuation piece is really important because you also want to kind of keep a, a sense and, and a pulse on the market. If if you are in raising now, right now the market is is challenging, right? Valuations have, have been depressed for a little while. So maybe it makes more sense to do a convertible note or safe financing push the valuation off to the future hopefully in six months a year or whatever the time may be the market rebounds valuations are now up now you go out to do your qualified financing where you're selling stock and, and that's when you would put a valuation on the company and at that point in time the market's better so maybe you get a better valuation or your qualified financing. So that's that can be a helpful or useful way to look at things as far as what sort of options do you want to use for your financing, um, whether it's a safe or a convertible note. Um, easier to document. There are relatively shorter documents. You don't need a whole bunch of documents. For example, a convertible note or a safe, it's usually the convertible note, maybe a note purchase agreement, and then your consent board, stockholder consent if you need that. Um, in a safe, it's basically the safe agreement. You can get the board to approve it and the, you know, potentially the stockholder that you need, but essentially it's, it's relatively easy to put in place and, and less expensive on legal fees. 
So what are some of the negatives or the cons? At least for convertible notes, keep in mind, this is debt. So you are taking a loan from an investor. Although most investors that are investing in startups using a convertible note do not expect to get repaid, it is nevertheless a loan and it's going to show up on your financials as debt. And at some point in time, if for whatever reason the investor wants to be repaid, there is a maturity date anywhere from, it can be anywhere from a year to three years or more, but typically there will be a, an end date of when that note has to be repaid. In some cases, it could be converted into equity at that point in time, but again, it is debt, so something to be thinking about. And because it's, a, it's debt, the investor is a creditor and they jump above the equity holders, the shareholders. So if there was some sort of liquidation of the company, they would typically get paid before the shareholders would. So something to be aware of. Next slide, please. Okay, so a little bit more on convertible securities. We talked a little bit about this. If it's a convertible note, it's gonna have a maturity date. It is a loan, so it needs to be, you know, there'll be a date at which it'll need to be repaid. Even though most investors don't want it to be repaid, it, you'll typically see that. You'll see an interest rate. It is a loan, so loans have to have an interest rate. Um, right now, the interest rates are, you know, higher than they were a few years ago. So, you know, you might see interest rates of six, seven, eight percent or more. Um, whereas a few years ago, they were lower than that. You'll have conversion terms that will provide for how the investment amount, the loan, is converted into security of the company. And those conversion terms, you know, there may be a, a number of different ways it can get converted. It could be by the decision of the note holder. So if they want to convert, they can convert. It could be automatically converted when there is a financing that happens in the future that I talked about. The other thing you want to pay attention to is, is how can that convertible note be amended? <laughs> if you go out and raise a bunch of money using convertible notes, and let's say you've got 10 or 15 note holders, that's, that's a pretty decent sized group. So what happens, let's say you put a one year maturity date on the loan, and then you realize six months into that time period, that, oh shoot, it's not long enough, I need more time. I, I won't be able to raise uh, a qualified financing round soon enough. So you need to now amend the notes to add more time to extend the maturity date. If you haven't set it up properly, you've got to go out to every single note holder, all 10 or 15 people, and get them to amend, agree to amend and extend the maturity date. Another way to approach it is basically you have a provision in your agreement that says, as long as we get a certain majority in interest of the note holders, then we can amend it, extend the maturity date, so we don't have to get every, every one of them to sign. As long as you get whatever the requisite majority is, then that amendment would apply to everyone. So it makes it a little bit easier. So there's all sorts of issues to be aware of when you're negotiating and drafting those sorts of um, instruments. And the remaining terms, not, not a ton of negotiation on, on the remaining terms. Those are sort of the main terms. You can see with convertible notes like safes, and I'll talk about um, discounts on the price when we go to convert or valuation cap, which basically works the same way. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, next slide, please. So a quick question, pre-money safes versus post-money safes. Um, the trend now is a post-money safe. Can you please comment on it? Yes, so <clears throat> safes were originally created by Y Combinator, which probably everyone on this uh, presentation knows of. If you don't, you can check out their website. I've got, I think, a link to it later on, but it's Y Combinator. They um, wanted to find an easier way for uh, companies and investors to be able to invest money. And instead of doing a price equity round, which requires a suite of documents, they created this simple agreement for future equity. It's a four or five page document. It's, it's pretty simple. And essentially the way it works is as follows. Investor puts in money, that money, that investment will be converted into shares when the company then goes and does a qualified financing. And qualified financing or next qualified financing or equity, financing, however it's defined with the safe, it, it will dictate when that trigger is. So the qualified financing may be defined to be when the company goes out and sells preferred stock at a minimum of $2 million, that's the trigger. And at that point in time, when it does that, the investment amount that was made with the safe converts into shares based upon whatever the terms of the safe are. And we'll talk a little bit about that. But 
when Y Combinator first created the safe, they created it basically on a on a using what was called a pre-money safe. So when you did the calculation, it was calculating out on a pre-money basis, which essentially was um, better for the investors, not as good for the um, founders because it ended up providing more dilution to the founders. Um, after a number of years and getting comments back from founders and investors, they updated their forms and they created what's now called the post money safe, which is a little bit more balanced because the calculations take into consideration um, the post money in, in doing some of the calculations to figure out you know, the number of shares it converts into. And so it's a little bit more balanced. It's not as dilutive to the founders. And so it's been typically better received in, in the marketplace. There are some other reasons as well. It's a little bit more complicated in calculating out the money safe when you're doing a conversion versus the post money safe. Um, but that's sort of a basic um, distinction between it. Um, okay, so going back to convertible securities, there can be a mandatory conversion at a discount price uh, that is a, in the next, that's paid in the next qualified financing. So what that means is essentially, if you have, it could be a convertible note or a safe, if you have a discount feature in that instrument, it was it will mean that, <clears throat> let's say the company, let's say investor puts in a million dollars in a safe, the safe has a 20% a discount. Then in six months, the company goes and, and sells stock at a dollar a share. So because the safe has a discount feature, when it triggers, when the next the qualified financing triggers a conversion of the safe, they're going to be able to purchase stock not at a dollar, but at 80 cents because they have a 20% discount, which is great for them because they end up getting more shares, right? Because they're buying it cheaper than what the investors that are buying the stock and the qualified financing are paying. They're paying a dollar. The, the person that invested in using the safe or the convertible note with the 20% discount is able to purchase that same stock for uh, 80 cents. Now, I say same stock. They essentially would be purchasing what's what is referred to as a shadow series. It's the same same stock, but it's got some differences. And the primary difference is the liquidation preference. If you remember, I talked a little bit about liquidation preferences. It's one of the preferences that preferred stock has <clears throat> over common. So if there's a sale of the company and there's proceeds, there's that waterfall I mentioned. So because the waterfall, oftentimes the liquidation preference is tied or key to the price that the investors paid for the preferred stock. So if, if a Series A investor paid a dollar for Series A preferred stock, that's their liquidation preference. They get back a dollar per share on the total number of shares that they invested in when there's some sort of liquidation event. However, when you have a, a safe or a convertible note that's converted into shares in, in another uh, qualified financing, they're buying it later after the initial Series A has been sold, you know, um, or, or sorry, at the same time as the Series A financing. But because they're getting it at a discount, we can't have the liquidation preference be the dollar, right? Because that's not going to be fair to them. They're actually buying it for 80 cents. So we have to create a, a what's called a shadow series. It, it, it's almost identical to the series A, except it's a little bit different in the sense that their liquidation preference is going to be different. It's going to be based on their purchase of 80 cents, not a dollar. So that way the liquidation preferences works because you couldn't give a liquidation of preference of a dollar a share to someone who bought it for 80 cents a share. That wouldn't be right because they'd be getting an extra 20 cents. So anyway, it's, it's a little bit nuanced, but essentially that's how it works. So if you have a discount, you can get a discounted price on the purchase of the shares of a qualified financing. Okay, so that's on discounts. There can be something called a conversion price cap. It's probably more frequently called a valuation cap. And it's essentially another way to get a discount for early investors, oftentimes early investors. So if you invest in a safe or a convertible note and it's got a valuation cap, what that means is you basically have a cap on the valuation of the company that you will use to calculate out the purchase price of the stock you'll be converting into once there is a qualified financing. And if the valuation cap is lower than the valuation that's set for the company at that next qualified financing, then you use the valuation cap to, do, to run your calculation to figure out what the purchase price is. And generally that will mean it's gonna be a lower purchase price than what the investors that are investing in that next qualified financing are gonna be paying. 
Um, there can be conversion upon a change of control or sale or liquidation, and then there can be an optional maturity um, conversion. Typically, you'll see that. You can see that in safes as well. Oftentimes, you may see that in convertible notes. So if at some point in time, the company doesn't raise financing before the maturity date of when the loan is due on the convertible note, then the note holder, the investor, could have an option to convert it into equity at that point in time. So instead of getting repaid, they may decide, hey, I don't get my money repaid. That's not enough of a, a return for me. I'm willing to roll the dice, I'll convert into equity, and then I'll you know, be a shareholder of the company going forward. That calculation is a little bit different because they're converting at a time when there is no financing. So you don't, you don't have a price per share of the next financing to use to calculate out how you're gonna convert into those shares. So you'll have to, there'll be another provision that'll provide an equation for how do you figure out what the price per share is. Um, so anyway, that's another another option or another feature you may see. Next slide, please. Okay, capitalization. Um, I'll go through this pretty quickly because I know we're, we're getting close to the hour. So just a few thoughts here to, to mention as you're thinking about your company, whether you've already set it up or whether you're in the process of setting it up, you want to be really careful and and really think about capitalization. You know, how much should you give? So if you're a couple of founders, two, three, four founders getting together, how do you allocate equity amongst the founders? If you've already formed your company, how do you allocate equity amongst early employees or consultants that are coming in to help the company grow? You know, make sure you you plan for it because ultimately every time you give equity out, there's going to be dilution to the founders. And so you just want to be, you want to make sure you're keeping track of that and understanding how that's going to impact the company and your ownership as a founder later on. One thing I'll come back to with regard to convertible notes and saves, because they convert into shares at a future date, you don't see the dilution on the founders on the day you take in their investment, right? Because they're not getting any shares on day one. They're just putting in money that will be converted into shares at a future date, whether it's three months, six months, a year, two years, whatever the case may be. But you want to keep track of the discounts offered, the valuation caps offered, and model it out because you want to know if at some point in time or, or when the company engages in a qualified financing, when the safes and the convertible notes are going to convert, what kind of dilutive impact is that going to have on the founders at that point in time? I've seen some companies that have gone out and said, okay, we need to raise money. They, they issued a whole bunch of safes and they gave a whole bunch of really low valuation caps or they give you know, large discounts and they weren't really thinking about how that's going to impact them. And then suddenly, two years later, they do a financing. They've got 25 safes. They've given everyone 25% discounts or they've given everyone really low valuation caps. And then when you actually model it out and you, you generate your performance to figure out what every single safe holder is going to be getting, as a result of this qualified financing that's taking place, you realize, oh my goodness, I've given up so much equity because now they're converting on these metrics. They're going to end up with all of these shares. And, and me as a founder, I'm, I'm going to be diluted significantly. So you want to be planning for that. So when I think, when, when I say think backwards when planning, think about every time you're giving out some sort of convertible security, no safe, what have you, what's the dilutive impact going to be on you? And, and is that a, a a time to think about how best to negotiate, what's market, what's not, what's too much to give out, what's sort of the right amount to be thinking about. Um, and then just plan plan for the dilution because it's going to happen. But going back to allocating, so just, you know, with founders, what I oftentimes say is, you know, think about control, think about ec economics, who's contributing what, what's fair to be able to allocate amongst the founders. And then when it comes to early employees and personnel, Usually, you don't give out a lot, depending on what they're contributing. You try to figure out what's market, figure out the amount of their contributions over time. Uh, make sure you do proper documentation. You have vesting put in place. So if it doesn't work out and they leave, the company can get that equity back if it's given it out. Um, <clears throat> okay, so a um, couple of more questions, but um, I'll, I'll address those at the end because I want to try to get through the rest of this. Incentivizing your team, it goes without saying, if you're going to be getting people to work for you, you want to make sure you incentivize them. It's a pretty competitive market, so oftentimes, you you know, in addition to paying them, if you can pay them, then you're going to be giving them some sort of equity, whether it's restricted stock or options or some other aspect. 
Um, we just want to make sure they're properly incentivized. Next slide, please. So a few more basics. I'll try to go through this fairly quickly, but things you should be familiar with. Pre-money valuation, what does that mean? Post-money valuation. So pre-money valuation is the value of the company before the next round of investment. So whatever the value of the company is, that's before the investment is put in. Post-money valuation basically just means it's the value of the company after that round of investment has been put in. So it's the pre-money valuation plus the amount of the uh, investment, and that means that equals the post-money valuation. I think I have it wrong on the parenthetical there. It's pre-money valuation plus investment equals post-money. Issued an outstanding basis, that's basically all of the stock that's issued and outstanding, that will give you ownership percentages as of whatever date you take that snapshot. That'll tell you who owns what on that date. You typically don't include options because options are just the right to buy stock at, in the future. You don't include safes. You don't include anything that isn't actually stock that's been issued and is outstanding and held by someone. Fully diluted basis, however, is when you look at all of the different equity and you assume that all that equity has been converted or exercised. So you would take all of the stock that's issued and outstanding. You would add to that any securities that can be converted to common. Um, you would add options you would look at convertible notes in some cases you look at safes depending on on what you're looking to solve for but that gives you a picture of the ownership on a fully diluted basis so assuming everyone who's got some sort of equity piece in the company some sort of convertible security assume all of that's been converted or assume it's all been exercised and shares have been purchased and you've got a total number of shares now what does that mean with regard to the company's ownership that's fully diluted basis. And it's important to understand both because on an issued and outstanding basis, you may have, you know, 55, 60% of the company. But when you factor in all of the options you've granted and all of the other convertible securities, when all of those have been exercised and turned into shares, then maybe your 60% goes down to 50 or goes down to 55 or maybe even below 50. So you want to make sure you're keeping track of all that. Next slide, please. So here's a couple of examples, just simple examples. The first case is basically if you had a pre-money valuation of 10 million. So there were 10 million shares of issued net standing to three different founders. So each founder had roughly 33.33%. If an investment was made in the company of $3 million, the purchase price per share would be a dollar. Founder A before the investment had 33.33%. After the investment, they would be diluted down to approximately 25%. Because when you factor in the additional $3 million investment and the additional shares that are going to be issued to the new investor, when you do the math, the founder has been diluted now down to approximately 25%. And then the new investor for their investment at a buck share, they're going to be getting approximately 23% of the company. Next slide, please. So I've created this. It's essentially the same thing, just showing it to you in, a, in an Excel format. Um, it's helpful to create these models if you're thinking about offering, you know, convertible notes or safes. So just kind of model it out. If you're doing a convertible note or a safe and you don't have an idea in mind of, in mind of what the qualified financing might be, just make some assumptions and, and make, you know, figure out what you think you might sell, how much you might take in as an investment, how many shares you might issue, what the purchase price might be, and then run some some models so you can kind of get a sense of what the impact is going to be. Next slide, please. Here's a couple of examples using convertible securities that we talked about. So for example, a note or, or a, um, uh, a safe. I'm going to skip over these a bit, the, the info's here, and then let's skip to the next slide, please. I've got a couple of examples here that shows you where you have a discount of 25%. <clears throat> and let's assume this is a convertible note or a safe, then the person that is investing, in this case, they're investing, uh, yeah, $450,000. If they're getting a 25% discount, they're going to end up with 600,000 shares. Whereas if they didn't have a discount, at a buck a share, they would end up with 450,000 shares. So you can see how the discount really ends up giving them a lot more shares in the company. 
Next slide, please. So this is a, another example where you have a discount, but you also have a valuation cap. And the valuation cap here is $5 million. The, the pre-money valuation is $10 million. <clears throat> So you essentially have a lower number here on the valuation cap. So you use the valuation cap to calculate out what the price per share would be for that particular investor. And if they're putting in um, the same $450,000 with the discount, you calculate it out, figure out what it would be with the valuation cap, you would figure out what the price per share would be. You end up getting a better price per share with the valuation cap. And depending on the save or the convertible note, oftentimes it's written in a way that gives the investor the better of the two, the greater of the two, that's going to result in more shares, either the discount or using the valuation cap. In this case, the valuation cap gives them more shares. So in this scenario, they'll end up with 900,000 shares because the valuation cap ends up giving them more shares. They get a lower purchase price per share of 50 cents versus 75 if they just have the 25% discount. So again, it gives an illustration of it's important to be thinking about those when you're issuing these sorts of um, investments. Um, next slide, please. And I know we're 10 o'clock. We have about half an hour reserved for Q&A. So let me see if I can get through the rest of this quickly, and then we can take some questions. So just overview of, of venture financing is what's going to be super important. And I'm sure you probably all know this is just having a really credible business plan, have milestones, what the company needs to reach in order to get to the next point. <clears throat> Perfect your pitch. You have a limited time to, to attract the interest of investors, especially sophisticated VCs. They get bombarded with business plans. They hear a ton of pitches. So you need to really stand out amongst the crowd. And the way to do that is have a really good business plan that addresses the sorts of issues that they're looking at, right? So you're, if you're the investor on the investor side, you're looking at, I wanna make sure it's a good company, good technology, it's, it's a company that can scale and, and grow and make a lot of money, which means obviously if it can grow and scale, then it can hopefully be a good target for an acquisition or an IPO down the road. And that's where the investor is going to make a return on their investment. So they're looking for that kind of potential. But they also want to know that it's it's been thought through well. You're addressing not only giving information about the company, but also addressing how they get their return on their investment and that your pitch is polished, you're you know, giving them good, concise information, and you've rehearsed it enough so you're comfortable talking about your company and understand it inside out. Run a systematic process, make sure you are getting enough capital from your earlier rounds we talked about, verbal notes for saves, to have enough of a runway to be able to plan properly to, to prepare for a VC financing, connect with the right investors, understand your deal, your ideal term sheet, Prepare for diligence, make sure your corporate records, all your documents are in good shape now, they're all buttoned up, organized, have good corporate hygiene, make sure you've got a good corporate lawyer that's helping you, make sure you've got all the right documents in place. Be prepared for cleanup if you haven't done things properly and do it now rather than later. Next slide, please. Talking a bit about what the overview of the, of the VC financing looks like. So, it really starts with you'll have some meetings, they'll be interested and at some point they say, OK, yeah, we, we want to invest. Then there'll be a term sheet. They typically, they, the investor, will typically draft the term sheet. But you need to know the term sheet. You need to know the typical provisions that are in a term sheet because you want to be very effective in negotiating. And I would encourage you to get your lawyer involved at the term sheet stage. Don't sign the term sheet and then go call your lawyer because oftentimes what you've done is you've negotiated probably against yourself if you haven't done this enough times to understand the important issues. The investors know the term sheet inside and out. They know all the terms. If you're not as equally intelligent and experienced about the term sheet, you're probably not going to negotiate the best deal for yourself. So how much of the company is being sold? Are there What are the dividends? What are the liquidation preferences? What sort of voting rights, protective provisions are there that the investors are going to get? Optional mandatory conversions, anti-dilution protection for the investors. What's the vesting for founders? Investors are going to want to make sure the founders, like anyone else, is invested and incentivized to stay with the company. So if you don't have vesting on your shares, you can expect founders off, or investors oftentimes will want the shares to be subject to vesting. Um, what's the proper documentation that's going to be prepared? Who's paying for attorney's fees? Oftentimes, investors will have the company reimburse them generally up to a certain amount on legal fees. Is there a no shop, meaning exclusivity? 
in the term sheet so that you can't go shop it around to other investors um, and, get, and then use them to pit each other, pit each other against uh, the different investors and negotiate better pricing um, and confidentiality provisions. Investors, are they getting a board seat? Are they getting observer rights? Those are all some of the main issues that get discussed and negotiated on term sheets. Um, there are others too, but those are some of the main points that you want to be thinking about and, and um, know and get uh, a little more involved. Next uh, slide, please. So we talked about the term sheet. The diligence is sort of the next piece of the process that will kick off. Once you've got a term sheet that's been signed, Investors may do a little bit of diligence before the term sheet gets signed, but once the term sheet is signed, that's when sort of the full blown diligence gets started. You will typically be sent a very long list of documents and information to produce. Uh, generally, it's put up into a data room that either you or your lawyer helps create. You want to organize it well so it's easy for the investor to get through it. But basically, they'll be going through and looking at all the company records, all the agreements, what, what you, whatever it is that you have to make sure that there aren't any sort of holes or skeletons in the closet. If there are issues or deficiencies, they'll raise those and then there can be discussions about, okay, what can be, what can be done to fix this or correct it? And that's part of the cleanup process that I mentioned. Um, the documentation process for a, a typical VC financing is usually gonna be based off of what we refer to as the NVCA forms. Those are model forms that were created by the National Venture Capital Association a number of years ago. They're updated on a regular basis. But those are the, the sort of the definitive financing documents that'll be used. There's a stock purchase agreement, amended restated certificate of incorporation, voting agreement, investor rights agreement, and a right of first refusal and co-sale agreement. Those are the main suite of documents. There'll be other documents, ancillary documents that'll be needed, but those are the main documents. They're all available at the website for the NBCA. They're model documents. They're used in probably, you know, 80, 90 percentage of all VC financing deals that are done in the US. Um, they've been well vetted. They've been prepared by, with input from lawyers, investors, companies. So they're, they're a really good set of documents and, and usually those will be the ones you'll want to start from. Oftentimes investors will, will draft the documents. In some cases they may have the company draft the documents, but regardless the starting point oftentimes is the NBCA. There are some others either Series C, which is the websites there, you can download their model forms. It's a it's a shorter version or more watered down version. Um, it's got a different format and it isn't as extensive as the NBCA forms. Not as often, not as frequently used. But if you've got a particularly small deal, it may be a little bit more, um, a little bit easier to get through those documents. Uh, maybe a little bit less expensive. But I typically suggest starting with NBCA because that's what typically everyone uses. Some law firms have their own proprietary forms as well. Once you got all the documentation going, the negotiations back and forth, there'll be a pre-closing where you want to make sure you've gone through and addressed any of the closing items, things that need to be done in order for the transaction to close, things that need to be delivered, you know, requests for um, the investor that need, they need information, they need certain documents to finish their diligence, negotiating the documents, providing the ancillary documents that are going to be important, board consents, stockholder consents, things of that nature, and getting everything teed up so that you've got all of those taking place. So then you can move on to the closing phase, which is making sure all the documents are signed, uh, making sure that you've got all the investors' signature pages, that you've got everything needed to close the transaction. You get sign off from the investors if they're ready to close. Once everything's been signed, all the documents are accounted for, and the parties have released their signatures, then typically that gets communicated to the investors. The investors will initiate their wires. And then once the wires come in and we confirm their funds have been received, then the closing um, is uh, confirmed. And then documents typically dated, if not dated already. And then you create your closing. So post closing items, there may be some things that, that are not required for closing, but that will be required after closing. So oftentimes within a certain period of time, after closing, you need to make sure the company is filing the security exemption filings that are necessary for the sale of the securities. But there could be some covenants that the investors wanted to be put in place, but weren't requiring to be done before closing. So, for example, maybe certain policies, procedures that the investors want to make sure the company adopts, but didn't necessarily need to be done before closing. 
Next uh, slide, please. So getting investment ready is, is really just making sure you're in the best position possible. So you've done everything you can. So when you sit down to sign your term sheet, you're not going to be scrambling in the last minute to try to get documents corrected, updated, um, get documents that need to be put into place. You know, you've got sort of data room already up and up and running. You've got documents organized in a way that rest of you're going to want to see. All of that's been taken care of. So clean company records, documents in your order. You've got a good cap table. Um, there are a lot of cap table management programs out there that you can use. There's Carta, there's um, Estella, there's Cake, there's a number of them. And they're all they're all pretty good. They're all different. But basically that's sometimes useful to get, especially as you start to get employees and, and consultants that are getting some sort of equity because you can keep track of it all. Some investors are going to require you to use one of those types of programs. You know, if, if you are starting to get to that point, then maybe you want to go ahead and sign up and get one of those now so you can get everything organized because then it's easy to spit out that report, send it to the investor. Here's my part of my Stella uh, report. It's my cap table. And if you've onboarded and uploaded everything properly, then oftentimes it's easy to maintain your cap table that way, much easier than the old school way, which would just keep you get on an Excel spreadsheet. Setting up a data room, maintaining your information, and then become familiar. Well, I oftentimes tell people that haven't been through this process is to become familiar with the NBCA form. Download them. They're free. You can get them from the website. Review them. Understand the provisions. Spend some time, you know, reading some articles about them, so you become as as educated as you possibly can. So as you're then going through the process, you'll understand them better. You'll be able to be able to better interface and interact with your lawyers um, and with the investor and the investor of the lawyers. It'll make the process a lot more uh, efficient. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Okay, so mantra will always be closing. Always do, you know, do your homework, make sure you're ready, make sure everything's um, organized. We talked about that before, so I'm not gonna go through it again, but um, do your own diligence on your company. Do your diligence on the potential investors so you know you're actually gonna be working with the right investors, the ones that know your your space, know your industry, uh, you get a good feeling about them, you wanna work with them. <clears throat> it's, it's a two-way street. As they're interviewing you, you should be interviewing them as well. Prepare for closing from day one. Make sure you've got your team internal and ex external ready to go. Set some reasonable timelines and organize and divide tasks appropriately so everybody knows what each person is doing. There isn't duplication of effort. You get the right person doing the right task at the right time, and that way you provide for a smoother, more efficient process. Next, uh, next slide, please. So. I'm not going to go over too many of these. Other than I talked about a few of them, just some things I've seen over the years. And a lot of it just comes from honestly not being prepared, not spending the time to do things right initially. And then somehow there's a misstep or something happens and it ends up becoming a problem that needs to be cleaned up down the road. Um, spending the time now and doing it right, getting good counsel involved will be probably the most effective way to manage the process and, and avoid a lot of the problems that will take time, could delay your deal from closing, or will end up costing a lot more because you've got to correct all the issues. And, you know, oftentimes lawyers need to be brought in to correct those issues, and that can take time and that obviously can take money. So <laughs> avoid all that, get everything done quickly, the right way the first time around. It'll, it'll make your life a lot easier. Okay, so I know I went past the hour, um, so let's uh, go to the next slide, please. And then let's advance to the next slide. I'll leave up my information so you have my email. You can reach out to me. So let's let's uh, talk about some questions that have uh, come up. Let me see if we've got a few here. Let me go through and see. Um, So a question on funding solution for equity debt financing for an energy project based in Dubai, worth about 25 to 30 million. This is a startup company in the UAE. Um, yeah, I'm not sure what the question is. Um, happy to talk with you offline, reach out to me. Um, I've done a lot of work on um, <clears throat> energy projects, renewable projects as well. So happy to chat with you if I can be of uh, service. Uh, can we create 
different classes of shares in the same company with different voting rights? Yes, you can. So the voting rights are, I mean, if you don't say anything in your charter, then, you know, it'll be defined by statute. But basically, you need to indicate in your certificate of incorporation what the voting rights are. Typically, common stock is, you know, one vote, one, one share, one vote, a share, although you can vary that. And so in some cases, you can have, you know, super voting common, which, for example, for every share of common stock you have, you get 10 votes or 100 votes or 1,000 votes. Don't see that too often. Um, some investors don't really like that. But yes, you can create different voting um, or different classes of shares in the same company with different voting rights. The um, preferred shares, if you have Series C or Series A or Series B or Series C, they typically, oftentimes, will have, it'll be one vote per share, but they will have also a different a set of privileges or preferences or rights, if you will, which may include protective provisions, which means if you're going to go do something, that falls into this list of enumerated actions that you'll need to go and get their consent. And it doesn't have to necessarily be all of the preferred shareholders. It's usually a percentage. It's either a majority of the preferred or it's some other you know, percentage, maybe 60%, 70%. And that'll all be defined in the certificate of incorporation. And that's usually something that's negotiated between the investor and the company. And if you have different classes, each class can have its own set of protective provisions. Um, and those are all negotiated differently as well. <clears throat> Slides will be, will be made available in the video afterwards within a few days. Um, question about the process to convert from an LLC to a C corporation. Um, it depends on what state the LLC was set up in. Um, some states have on their, in their statutes uh, conversion provisions that allow you to convert from one type to another type. Um, some don't, so it, it's kind of a state-by-state -state analysis, but essentially what you have to do is you have to convert, prepare the documentation that says essentially we are going to convert this entity into a corporation, so the interests in the interests that are held by the owners of the LLC are going to be exchanged for interests, shares in the corporation. So once the dust settles on the conversion, essentially the LLC will become a corporation, the owners of the LLC will become the owners of the corporation and will have the shares that they have. Essentially, you know, the shares they have hold in the LLC will become shares that, that they will own in the, the uh, corporation. <clears throat> One thing I will tell you, though, it's not, a, it's not a simple process. You need to make sure you're working with good counsel that can help you through that. Not only just the corporate counsel, but also tax counsel, because in some cases there could be tax consequences or, or you know, negative tax consequences if you don't do the conversion properly. Um, thoughts on Delaware versus Wyoming company registrations? Um, that, that's an uh, interesting question. Uh, I think I answered it earlier on in the presentation. So if the plan you have is to go out and raise financing from sophisticated investors, including venture capital investors, then you're going to want to, in, in all cases, choose Delaware as your jurisdiction. It's what uh, the investors prefer. It's what a lot of investors will require. They will not invest in another type, another jurisdiction. They will only invest in a Delaware entity. Um, so <clears throat> my suggestion is, unless you've got some really compelling reason to set up something other than a Delaware corporation, I would usually recommend setting up a Delaware corporation if you're going to go out and raise money from sophisticated investors or VCs. Um, Another question, where can I find the standard term contract for seed investment structure that's convertible debt that you mentioned earlier? That's a good question. I didn't, I didn't mention that. So for SAFES, you have the Y Combinator website where you can go and get the Y Combinator form of SAFE, which is what most people use. There isn't a similar place you can go to get sort of a model uh, convertible note, um, <clears throat> at least not that I'm aware of it. You can, you know, there are some sites where you can get some information about convertible notes, but um, I think more often than not, the better way to approach this is to find the attorney you want to work with. And if it's someone that works in the startup space that does financings, then they, they will be able to prepare a convertible note for you. Uh, let's see. I've, only, I've only attended pitch events where multiple startups are pitching to an investment panel. Is this the most common initial interaction between startups and investors? 
Well, for pitch competitions, um, yes. I mean, I've, I've judged a, a number of those and attended a number of those. And yes, you'll have a number of, of, of startups that will get up one at a time in front of invest, a panel of investors or panel of judges, and they'll pitch their, their business. In some cases, it's just a pitch and there's no, no award. In some cases, they're actually buying for and competing for a potential award, potential check um, from the investors or from the organization. Um, that is a pretty common uh, for pitch pitch competitions. That's a common way to do it. But when I say pitch, what I mean is if you get to a point where you're introduced to an investor and you've got a meeting, you need to you need to pitch them, right? Because ultimately you're meeting with them because you want to get a check from them. So you need to be able to pitch the investor. And you need to be able to sell them on why your company is the is the latest and best investment for uh, that fund. Going to the pitch competitions though is a really good way to, to hone your skills, to become comfortable speaking in public, become comfortable with the pitch format, comfortable with answering questions. Because oftentimes after you give your, your pitch, the judges will sit there and pepper you with questions. So you're you're getting trained in how to respond to questions that investors might ask, which is a really good, good practice. Do angels do the same diligence as VC funds um, or do angels have a softer approach? Um, great question. It depends on the angel, but you know, if typically speaking, anyone who's done investments, who's experienced, is going to do their diligence to get comfortable to know there aren't any skeletons in the closet that might jeopardize their investment. I mean, typically the the VCs will run a, a maybe a more standardized approach to diligence. They um, will use outside counsel to conduct a lot of legal diligence. They oftentimes will do a lot of the um, technical, operational, financial diligence in-house if they've got the resources, or they will bring in third parties that specialize in doing that kind of diligence. So it could be operational diligence, it could be technical diligence. They bring in a specialized firm that basically will kick the tires on the product, make sure it works, validate it, all, all of those sorts of issues. Angels are all over the place. Some do a lot of diligence, some don't do as much. I think it just really depends on the experience of the of the angel. Um, I've seen I've seen a whole wide range. Uh, yes, by by all means, um, please send me your LinkedIn uh, requests. We'd be happy to connect with you on LinkedIn. And again, happy to answer questions. If you have any, any specific you want to talk to me about, or if there's anything I can do to be of service, um, please feel free to reach out. It doesn't have to be, by the way. Just on startup stuff, uh, I've had people reach out to me after these presentations because they need an IP attorney or they needed an appointment attorney. And as I said, we're a full service firm, but if you, if you need anything that's not within my area of expertise as a corporate lawyer, I can certainly find the right folks within the firm. So definitely reach out if we can be helpful. Okay. If the company is clean without any transactions, operations, um, is that scary to investors? Um, Interesting question. No, it's not scary to investors. I think what investors are looking for is if you are very early stage, you don't have a lot of transactions, you don't have any operations, you're sort of creating the technology that you think is going to be valuable. There are investors that invest in very early stage companies that are pre-revenue, don't have a product yet. It's all very conceptual. And that's their space. That's what they do. They enjoy it. They know it. They're comfortable in it. So no, that's not going to be scary to them at all. They actually will expect that because that's the, the, the space that they play in. That's that's what they are, are used to. So they will understand how to assess the business. They'll understand typically the market that you're in. They'll understand if, if what you're thinking about, your, your concept, your proposed solution makes sense to them. If they think it's going to be scalable, they'll be they'll be able to assess that. If you go to the wrong investor, so let's say you're early stage, you haven't, you don't have proof of concept, you don't have a prototype, but you've got this great idea and you think it's proprietary, it's not out there, nobody's doing it, but you think it's scalable and, and can be a phenomenal business. But you go to an investor that's used to investing where a company has revenue and has a product and it's got contracts with customers, and you may have initial meeting, depending on how you're introduced, but they're probably not going to be the right investor. So they're going to probably within a very quick period of time when we start talking to them say, yeah, not, not right for us. We don't invest in that space. 
So make sure you're you're getting interest to the right investors and you're meeting with the right investors. You don't want to waste your time and talk to someone who's not going to be maybe a great investor, great VC firm, but they're not right for you. Okay, so let me see. I think those are all the questions that came through. We're at about 10, 23. We've got a few more minutes. Um, <clears throat> let me see if there's up. any other questions. So question about being the sole founder, should they issue, should she issue all the shares to herself at the present? So that's a great question. So when you set up your company, yeah, you can you can issue all the shares to yourself. But what I would say is reserve some shares so that you've got some shares you can issue to other people. If you bring in another co-founder, or if you want to set up an equity incentive plan, you want to have some shares reserved under that plan to be able to give out either by restricted stock grants or option grants to early people that you may be bringing in, early employees or consultants or advisors. <clears throat> so that way you, you don't run out of shares. So one thing we didn't quite talk about is when you set up your company, you have to indicate how many authorized shares the company has that it can issue. So think of it, think of it as a checkbook. You put $1,000 into your checking account, you can write a check for up to thousand dollars. If you can't write a check for more than thousand dollars, it's going to bounce and there's going to be all sorts of problems. So <clears throat> it works very much the same way. You create a company that's got a million shares or ten million shares. You can only issue that number of shares that you've authorized. So if it's ten million shares, you cannot issue more than ten million shares unless you amend your charter, your certificate of incorporation, to increase the number of authorized shares you have, which can be done and get done all the time. So coming back to your question, typically we would recommend in that early stage scenario, single founder, set up your company, let's say it's 10 million shares, issue yourself maybe 8 million, maybe six, seven or 8 million shares or even 9 million shares and reserve 1 million for an equity incentive plan. So you've got some shares in reserve that you can use and issue as and when needed. How do you find investors at the idea stage? Um, great question. You basically need to really spend some time looking at different uh, organizations. There are organizations that uh, you know will have events and they'll invite investors to come and speak. Uh, there are trade organizations. There are other organizations, or you may even start looking at some of the investors and trying to get a sense of who's playing in what space. Um, <laughs> I don't know that I have a, a specific list of what investors invest at different stages, but oftentimes when you go to investors' websites, they will tell you sort of a little bit about the, the fund or a little bit about the firm. And oftentimes there is where you'll see, okay, we're a, a firm that specializes in life sciences and healthcare. So there, obviously, that's one clue that, okay, if I've got, if I'm in that space, great, they may be a potential investor. But they oftentimes will give more information about. You know, we're an early stage investor. We invest in in companies that are, you know, have less than X in revenue or their pre-revenue. And there isn't any sort of easy way to get that answer other than going to maybe some meetings, trade organization events, conferences, and start meeting people and asking and talking around and then just maybe creating your own list, looking around, doing some some Google searches to see who is in that particular space. It just takes some time. Um, sometimes you can talk to lawyers. We work with a lot of investors, a lot of uh, funds, so we oftentimes have a sense of who's in that space and who's not. Um, okay, so we've got time for a couple more questions. Uh, the LLC to, to C Corp conversion process. So we had a follow up question about that. So just going over it again. So what you're doing essentially at a high level is you're taking the LLC and you're converting it using a statute that allows you to convert to a corporation. <clears throat> so essentially, um, the shares of the LLC would be converted into shares of a corporation. So the owners of the LLC at the end of that conversion process will become owners of uh, the shares of the corporation. Um, <clears throat> you'll, you'll have a conversion agreement typically and then once the entity is converted, you'll be filing the, the necessary paperwork that will be important to have for the corporation to be created. Because if you're an LLC now and you've created your LLC, 
there is no corporation that's been created yet. So the conversion documentation will provide for how the conversion takes place. So how the shares or the units or membership interests of the LLC will be exchanged for shares of the corporation. So that part is governed by sort of a conversion agreement. But the rest of that process will require actually creating the corporation. <clears throat> so you'll need to create certificate of incorporation bylaws. You'll need to have uh, a board appointed, the directors appointed, and then you'll need to have officers appointed. So all of the stuff that happens when you normally create a corporation, that still happens, but it'll happen after the conversion has taken place. <clears throat> Hopefully that, that provides a little bit more um, information. Um, last question, uh, and then we'll call it a day. Do you have to inform the state of Delaware that all price shares have been issued? If you don't, how can you update the record? Uh, yes, so to create a corporation, you have to file your certificate of incorporation with the Secretary of State in your state. So we'll assume it's Delaware. You file your certificate of incorporation with the Delaware Secretary of State. The certificate of incorporation will have a number of things in it. One of the things that will have in it, it'll, it'll say how many shares are going to be authorized. That's your authorized number of shares. That's what you have that you can issue. So then let's say six months, a year down the road, you decide, oh, I need more shares. You file an amendment to your certificate of incorporation or an amended and restated certificate of incorporation with the Delaware Secretary of State, which effectively increases the authorized number of shares. That's how you increase the authorized number of shares, but you have to make sure you do it properly. You have to make sure you, you make the appropriate filings with the Delaware Secretary of State. And I've seen that happen where people want to increase the number of shares. They don't do the right filing with the Secretary of State. If you don't file, and it's not part of your um, file charter, the file certificate incorporation or amended certificate incorporation, it's not effective. So <clears throat> that's that's something I've seen people mess up with um, on occasion. We are at 1030. I know it's been a long hour and a half. I really want to thank everyone for participating and spending the full hour and a half to listen to what I had to say. Hopefully some of that resonates with you and is helpful. I am happy to connect with any of you. Send me a LinkedIn request or reach out via email. You have my email here. The link to the, the recording and the slides will be made available. I wish all of you much success uh, with your ventures and uh, hope to chat with you again soon. Thank you so much.